This is a shell and tube style heat exchanger with one shell pass and two tube passes. This means that the cold water inlet kind of snakes in and out twice, but the outer shell, the sh shell, <laughs> right, the water vapor just flows through one time. Effectiveness NTU method heat transfer problems are gonna seem kind of strange at first, but if you just work through a couple of practice problems, get a little bit more familiar with the terminology, you can get past that and at least be thankful that these problems are much shorter than convection problems. Some convection problems were gigantic. Even the worst NTU problem is still only gonna be medium sized. The way to recognize an NTU, number of transfer units problem, is that you will usually be given UA, surface area and overall heat transfer coefficient. You usually know the information about the heat exchanger itself and your unknowns are exit temperatures. If you already know exit temperatures and you're trying to find information about the heat exchanger, like the surface area, that's an LMTD, log mean temperature difference problem. It's a little bit easier probably. NTU is used when you know the heat exchanger, UA, and you're looking for exit temps. And so for this problem, we're asked to find the effectiveness, which is another clue that this is an NTU problem, the exit temperature for the cold water, and also the overall rate of heat transfer. Normally for assumptions, I write down assumptions as I go through the problem. Each time I make an assumption, I write it down, but I can tell that I'm gonna make a couple right here from the beginning. I'm gonna assume steady state operations so that the mass flow rate doesn't change, because I was only given one value, just an easy way to pad the problem a little bit. And I'm also gonna assume that there's constant properties, so CP is constant. Technically specific heat changes as temperature changes, but I'm just gonna use one value for that. Um, it's a small simplification, but it, it's gonna make the problem a lot easier. So my textbook has basically a table that lists effectiveness equations for a bunch of different styles of heat transfer. Parallel flow, counter flow, shell and tube, cross flow for this one shell pass, two tube pass. I actually have an equation for it, so I can just write that down right off the bat. Two times a quantity, a bunch of C and exponential NTU terms in here. So I'm gonna need to solve for C, the heat capacity ratio. You may also see this listed in other textbooks as CR, the ratio of C. This is the minimum over maximum value for C. And NTU is gonna stand for number of transfer units. And C is M dot CP. And there'll be a separate value of C for the cold water and a separate value of C, capital C, for the water vapor. So for the cold water, M dot times CP, uh, we're given a mass flow rate of 0.5 kilograms per second, and we're given CP 4179, so 2090 watts per meter Kelvin. That is the value of capital C for the cold flow, that is the capacity rate, heat capacity rate for the cold flow. Now for the hot flow for water vapor, it's really interesting. We were given an inlet temperature of 100, but we were not given a mass flow rate. How can you find capital C heat capacity rate without knowing M dot? Well, we were given in this problem that this was a condensation problem, that water vapor is condensing. For condensation, CP is infinite. That is, in theory, no matter how much heat we add, we're not seeing a change in temperature. All of this heat is creating a phase change from vapor to liquid. So the temperature goes from a 100 degree vapor to a 100 degree liquid. Now we are making a slight assumption here that we're not taking away so much heat that not only does all the vapor become liquid, but then it further cools to an even cooler liquid. We are making an assumption we're not going that far. But as long as we don't actually take that much energy out of the system, as long as quality doesn't drop to zero, as long as there's still some value of quality between zero and one, then we can use capital CH heat capacity rate for the hot water vapor of infinity 
because there's gonna be no change in temperature during condensation. This lets us then calculate that C minimum, the lowest value for C is the 2090, because 2090 is lower than infinity. So C max is infinite. So then this ratio C, or CR if you wanna call it, the minimum C divided by maximum C, 2090 divided by infinity, C is gonna be zero. Whenever one of your fluids is going through a phase change and it's gonna have an infinite value for a C, this is gonna be a CR value of zero. The heat capacity ratio is gonna be zero because one of the streams is going through condensation. All right, let's do NTU because I'm tired of saying the letter C. So NTU, three totally different letters now. So, oh, NTU is gonna be UA. So we had a couple more, oh, and divided by C. All right, well, we're ne just never gonna escape it. So NTU, number of transfer units, is a ratio between UA and CP. So think of the uh, heat transfer equations. You've got M dot CP delta T, and UA delta T. Those delta T terms are different, right? For M dot CP delta T, it's the temperatures within a stream, like inlet versus outlet. And for the UA delta T, you're comparing the two temperatures that are right next to each other. But NTU, number of transfer units, is a ratio of, of the front parts of these equations, UA versus M dot CP. And specifically the M dot CP, whichever one is lower. And so NTU, number of transfer units, is gonna be uh, just a value greater than zero. It can be greater or less than one, but a really small value, like a value less than one, is gonna mean very little effectiveness. Not a lot of heat transfer is happening. And a large value for NTU means we're gonna get close to 100% effectiveness, that there's a lot of heat transfer happening. And so the ways you get a small value for NTU, a small amount of heat transfer, is either gonna be a low value for you, right? A, a low heat transfer coefficient or a small heat exchanger, small a. You can also get a small value for NTU with a large denominator, meaning a large mass flow rate or a large specific heat capacity. Because if the water's moving very fast, it doesn't really have time to heat up that much. And if CP is really large, even if a ton of heat is dumped in, it's gonna have a really small change in temperature. So NTU is sort of a measure of effectiveness. A large value for NTU means more heat transfer is happening and you're getting a more larger change in temperature. So plugging these numbers all into this effectiveness equation and don't lose track of that negative one exponent. So I'm actually gonna write this as a fraction, two divided by everything instead of two times stuff to the negative one power. So two divided by all of that stuff. And this should always be an effectiveness between zero and one. Effectiveness is like a percentage. And in your denominator, you'll see there's a one plus C. This is the capital C. This is your heat capacity ratio, which in our case was zero. And then one times this bracketed term of, you know, one plus E to the thing, one minus E to the thing. That bracketed term should always be greater than one right? One plus something is more than one minus something. And so your denominator will always be greater than two, no matter what your heat capacity ratio is, and no matter what that bracketed exponential term is, the denominator will always be greater than two. So in this case, we get an effectiveness of 0.38. So 38% effective, meaning our actual heat transfer is 38% of the maximum possible heat transfer. And let's compare this against a figure. Your textbook probably has a figure for effectiveness as well, which you can look up. If you know NTU and you know capital C, the heat capacity ratio, you can look up in the figure. And in my figure, it looks like about 0.39 is probably where I'd put it. That's pretty close to the 0.38 with, we got from the equation. So I'm gonna, keep the point 3803. I'm not gonna use the figure because the equation's way more accurate than the figure. I'm only looking up in the figure so that I can make sure I didn't make any calculator mistakes. All right, so let's go now to rate of heat transfer. 
So effectiveness is equal to, and I'm grabbing this equation from the FE reference manual, Q dot divided by Q dot max. So we just solved for effectiveness and we're looking for Q dot, the actual rate of heat transfer. So what is the maximum rate of heat transfer? Maximum rate of heat transfer is not defined in the FE reference manual. That's actually kind of an oversight, I think. But the minimum value for capital C, so your minimum heat transfer rate times your maximum change in temperature, T hot in minus T cold in. So that's the maximum change in temperature because if your hot flow comes in at 100 and your cold flow comes in at 15, so the maximum that the cold flow can heat up to is gonna be the 100, right? It can never get hotter than that because your hot flow's only gonna cool down. So same thing for the hot flow, it starts at 100, it's never gonna get colder than 15 because the cold flow is only gonna heat up from 15. So the maximum that either stream could change would be 85 degrees. It's probably gonna be less than that, but 85 degrees is the maximum that either stream could change. And so when we look at, well, which, the hot or the cold, which one might go that 85 degrees? Well, it's, in our case, it's definitely not gonna be the hot flow because the hot flow is a specific heat rate of infinite, meaning it takes an infinite amount of heat to get it to change temperature. So the flow that's gonna change temperature the most is gonna be the one with the lowest heat transfer rate. That's a little misleading. Rate seems like a, a faster rate would change more, but this rate is kind of named backwards. So a lower heat transfer rate requires less heat to change temperature. So the 2090 times this 85 degree delta T is the maximum heat transfer rate we could see if the cold 15 degree fluid changed all the way up to 100 degrees at its outlet. That's the maximum amount of heat that the cold stream could absorb in this heat exchanger. And that maximum amount of heat that this cold flow could absorb times the 38% effectiveness shows how much heat it actually does absorb, right? Only 38% of that maximum, which comes out to be about 67,000 watts or about 67 kilowatts. And this lets us solve for what the final temperature actually is. We have our Q dot is M dot CP delta T. We just solved for Q dot, the 67,000 watts. M dot CP for the cold flow, this is 2090. And then the delta T is the actual exit temperature for the cold flow minus the 15 degree inlet temperature. We get an outlet temperature of 47.33 degrees Celsius. Again, not very close to the 100 degrees, but that kind of makes sense because we're only, this effectiveness was only 38%. If the effectiveness were more like 90%, then we might have seen an exit temperature around 90 degrees, a lot closer to that maximum possible exit temperature. If you're starting to understand this effectiveness NTU method, but you wanna see another example problem, just to double check, I've got a cross flow heat exchanger problem linked up on the screen. That'll be the best video for you to watch next, just to hear the terminology a little bit more, get a little bit more practice.